Good evening and welcome to the 13th Annual Writers' Symposium by the Sea at Point Loma Nazarene University. My name is Carl Martin. I teach American literature and serve as the chair of the Department of Literature, Journalism, and Modern Languages. This year, for the first time at the symposium, we've uh, added a new addition, a songwriter. Uh, so I'm uh, very pleased to uh, welcome uh, John Foreman, the primary songwriter and lead singer for the band Switchfoot. Would you welcome John with me? To date, Switchfoot has uh, produced six critically acclaimed albums, starting with 1997's uh, Ode to Chin, and the latest O oh, Gravity. Uh, John, I think the standard question that, that uh, is often posed to songwriters is what the process is like for you. Does it start with lyrics? Does it start with a tune? Can you talk about that a little bit? And feel free to demonstrate as much as you'd like. All right. Yeah, I think um, the, the concept of the song uh, flows down two rivers. And in, in, in times when the, the concept is very defined, often the lyric will begin first. And then in other times when it's more of a sentiment or a mood or a feeling, the, the kind of the music starts first. Um, I feel like it works best when they're both written at the same time. It feels like a more equal marriage. But sometimes you, you kind of have to work with what you have at the time. And it's... it's the most exciting time is when you feel like you're actually uncovering something that um, is almost like buried treasure or something like that, you know, and I feel like that's, that's the most exciting time for me as a songwriter. You know, every day you dig and then sometimes you come across a lost city and it feels like something that is a little bit more timeless than something that's got my fingerprints on it. Mm. I read an interview where you said that sometimes I'll just write a song a day for a month or two. It's just a good discipline. It helps you to, to become a better songwriter and helps you to get your ideas and emotions out in a tangible way. When you write that many songs, and, and I was reading another place where it said that for one of the albums you had about 60 songs written and about 10 or 11 made it on the album. How, what's that process like then when you have all this material, more than you know that you'll use for a specific album? Um, I feel like... Um, that's always been our, our problem as a band is having too much material. And it sounds like an odd problem, but it, it really is a problem because um, you end up uh, spending more time trying to decide what's going to make the cut than actually working on the tunes. If you've got five good songs, you spend your time really wisely and invest in those songs. When you've got 60, you're kind of scattered thin. Um, but I, I really do, I think for me, it's, it's not uh, the process of a record. It's the process of, of maybe just writing songs, you know. And most of the songs I, I write are never heard. And that's kind of always been the case. And I, I don't see a way of making that any different, you know. So maybe it's, it's just the blessing and the curse. But I, I think for me, I love writing songs enough to kind of have the excess material. And as a songwriter, are there other songwriters that you've kind of patterned yourself after? Were there, were there songwriters that early on were inspirations to you that you looked at as models? Yeah, I, I really, um, I heard a, g a great quote from Sting one time where he said that all the early um, police records were just James Taylor songs sped up, <laughs> you know? And, and I like both of those guys, so it felt like I was right at home. Um, and I'm sure that's kind of the, the, uh, the common theme, you know, the Beatles taking stuff from the States and speeding it up and playing it their own way. Um, I think for a long time, I went to school up in North County, San Diego, and, and every band that went to my high school was a punk band. And, and I, I kind of, I never really was quite punk enough. To, to fit in with that scene. I, I, I had a lot of friends that were in those bands and I'd always go to the shows, but our music was fairly, um, I think it had a lot more of, m more melody and a little bit less angst, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. And I, I think maybe I, I loved the Beatles and Zeppelin growing up and, um, and then Motown was also played a lot in, in our household. 
so there's a lot of strong melody. Yeah. That, that balances out with that punk scene. That right, right, with yeah. High school. That's interesting. I think there's something, that, something to be said for um, a swagger. You know, a certain, whether it's in the lyric or in the delivery, in the, the way that the instruments are played, a confidence that always attracted me, whether it's the Beatles or Zeppelin, that they kind of, even if they didn't know what they were doing, they made you feel like they did. Now, the other thing I, I noticed, too, in listening to the albums, that there's such an interplay between um, the guitar lines and your vocals and, and so forth. We hear the final product. Is a lot of that worked out in the studio, in rehearsal? I mean, you come in with a, you write on your guitar, and you come in with, with an idea of, of the melody. Um, do you have, how much of the, uh, of the interplay between the, the other band members do you kind of have in your head when you, yeah. go, when you start rehearsing, or is that something that you guys work out together? Well, sometimes you, you're inspired in production to implement something that you hear. Um, I can remember for, there's a song called Dare You To Move that, that I had in my head very distinct what the, the production was going to be. Um, we were listening to this, this record, Clarity, by Jimmy Eat World, and the first three songs on that record have a, like just a completely different blueprint than anything I'd ever heard before. And so you can hear it in your head what's going to happen. Um, and other times, you, you really have no clue. And you kind of, I guess the, the uh, analogy would be the idea that you you, uh, you got to bring this kid through pu puberty. And um, he's, he's a great kid, but who knows what he's going to be, right. you know, yeah. 10 years from now. Right. So you, start, you play with an electric guitar and a drum set, and... Sometimes it turns out great, and other times, you know, he ends up on drugs. <laughs> <laughs> and you have to ask him to leave the album. Yes. Yeah, yeah, that's when you have to get him out. And also on, on, um, on the album New Way to Be Human, there's a, a song that, um, that's kind of written in tribute or inspired by Soren Kierkegaard. There's another one with Augustine. So apparently there's some people who aren't songwriters who also have a play a factor, play a role in your songwriting. Yeah. It, did that, was that always the case? Did that, has that kind of grown over time? I think that, I mean, the great thing about art in general is that you're, you're this medium. You know, you're kind of, you're a vessel that gets to um, perceive something, whether it's visual or, or you heard it or you read it or you thought it or somebody told it to you. And you take it in, and then you're able to, to give it out in this other form, you know? And, um, and I feel like I've heard the, the quote, good writers borrow, great writers steal, you know? And um, I think that th that kind of gave me a license to take these literary works and put them into song, you know? Um, I've done it since with a bunch of different people, Bukowski. Um, I think there's, there's places where you can find almost transcendent truth in somebody else's writing, and you take that and you say, wow, that, that, just, that right there needs to be a song. Interesting. Yeah, I think, I think Woody Guthrie once said that someone pointed out that someone had stolen one of his songs, taken a tune and put their own words to it, and they said, that's okay. He just stole from me. I steal from everybody. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think that's a lot of songwriting. It's just that kind of sense of taking all this in and kind of, like you say, sending it out in another medium. Yeah, and I think it's, somebody asked me today in an interview what my favorite part about um, my job was, if you can call it a job. And I'll cross that question off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I, and I, that is my favorite part, is the idea that you can actually give something to someone. And it might not be yours. I think the, the best ideas I've ever had were somebody else's that I just kind of, I mean, timeless, transcendent truth is not something I'm going to come up with. And, and so those are the best songs, I feel like, the times when you just simply put something that's timeless in a frame and allowed it to speak to somebody new. Uh, to shift gears a little bit, the, the, um, from, from Company Car on uh, New Way to Be Human to Paparazzi to Lonely Nation, to, I love this title, Happy is a Yuppie Word, uh, and American Dream. Um, 
we might get the feeling that you're, that you're troubled by the materialism that you see around you. Uh, I, I started getting that impression. Um, uh, are those, is that critique of materialism something that you kind of consciously return to in the songs? Is this something that I want to write a song about this? Or have these been songs that just kind of emerged as well? I think that songwriting can be one of the better metaphors I've, I've come up with is, is it's like an oyster with a, a grain of sand in it. And you, you wrestle with it. And, and um, sometimes you come out with a pearl and you can get rid of it and you feel like you've, you've gotten through it. But um, usually for me, I write about the same things every time. You know, it's just the same irritant. Um, and I think the, 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 the trick is for me to try and um, not write the same song. Because I think the same irritants exist in my life that existed when I was 21. Um, you know, I'm sure there's new irritants and, and new things to be excited about. But the idea that, you know, if, if you're someone who finds kind of comfort and and release in a song, then if the irritant's still there, then you're still going to be writing about it. I think the hope is that you're taking it from a different side. You're taking it from a, um, a different perspective. Um, but yeah, I mean, with materialism, I think, you know, I mean, we have material bodies and we need clothes and houses and, and ways to move around. Um, I think the thing that, that's really tough is to live in a society that, that has everything and, and sees getting more things as a good idea. And so, you know, getting a chance to travel around the world and see other cultures that have so much less and have so much more on a spiritual plane, um, maybe that's part of the irritation. Yeah, that w is it American Dream where that we're when success is excess. Yeah, when success is equated with excess. I also like tongue twisters, and, yeah. and, and that's a good one. Yeah. <laughs> that is, it's a hook. It, it really gets, it captures your attention, and I think for listeners it sees, well, this is a new way of thinking about this. This is a new way of remembering this. It's a yeah. very effective device. I have, um, I, I think a lot of times, this is probably true for everyone, but there's all these things that I put into the songs for me that I, I really... Uh, it makes me smile, and I don't know if anyone else yeah, right. smiles about it. But um, it really doesn't matter. Yeah, but that's <laughs> not what you're writing for. And um, two of our our singles have been kind of centering around uh, the theme of of entropy and and the idea of social entropy and the idea that well, oh, gravity, for example, if gravity is you know the uh, the force that keeps bodies with mass attracted to each other and keeps things uh, keeps us here glued on the planet. Why is it that the social equivalent does not exist? You know, and, and um, those are the types of things that, again, you're, you're kind of wrestling with it in your head and you see um, in physics this kind of parallel universe and you say, well, let's write a song about that and maybe that will have certain light to bear upon our social situation. Uh, you want to play something? You wanna, you wanna, are you working yeah, on? Yeah, sure. Are you man. working on something that you're? This is this is probably a good a good song about that. This is a song called "War in My Blood," because I think even though I try and uh, I try and play nice, most of the time that doesn't come out as nice as I want it to. Um, I'm doing this project with my friend Sean. It's going to be called The Real Sean John until, yeah. Our goal is to get sued by Puffy. So if you're watching, Puffy. Um, yeah, so it, it's uh, with a guy, Sean, from Nickel Creek. And this is a song called War in My Blood. Gone from my girl, we not leave her alone. And when 
I think some fans of, of, of uh, Switchfoot and I think some fans of Nickel Creek would be surprised to see these two groups coming together. Think that we like actually hang out and stuff? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no. But it seems like that's really stretching you musically in a direction that, again, you might not have, have gone without that kind of, uh, without that interaction. I know that when I saw the, the uh, members of, of Nickel Creek you know, credited on one of the albums, I thought, yeah. really? Nickel Creek? Yeah. <laughs> No, they're they're great, man, and I think um, I love I love collaborating with people. I, I wish we had um, time to do it more often, because um, uh, there's there's so many different different flavors out there, and it's always nice when you can kind of mix and match. And it seems like it also uh, keeps you from kind of settling into oh, this is our sound. Yeah, is that right. I mean, it seems to me like as I as I have and I've been listening to you know all six albums a lot the last couple of weeks, especially here. <laughs> uh, but but uh, it, it's, there's not a, a single style that you say, oh, that's, that's Switchfoot. There, there's, there's, seems like there's a lot of variety there. Is that something you guys work on intentionally to kind of keep that a little freer than it, than, than it might otherwise be? Yeah, well, I think, um, I remember in high school, again, it all goes back to high school and Led Zeppelin, but... <laughs> um, all of my friends wanted to have a certain sound. They they loved a band and they loved that sound. And I remember, for better or for worse, that's not the way it came to me. It was always, well, this song sounds kind of um, really slow and delicate, and this song sounds really fast and upbeat. And so instead of trying to make the slow, delicate one try and fit in with the others, it was just kind of the type of thing where the approach was, let's make every song as good as it can be. And I, I don't know, I think, I mean, all of my favorite, or most of my favorite experiences with a record are the types of things where you travel from place to place, you know. Um, again, Zeppelin and the Beatles, you know, I mean, I think you, you go from place to place. And, and certainly throughout their career, they covered a lot of ground. And... Um, I think the tricky thing is um, trying to figure out how to do that in a way that, that brings people along with you. 
and and keeps yourself, you know, kind of interested in the process as well. That's kind of the dichotomy of of playing the live show. Is you know, I love pretty much most of our songs that we play. Um, they're all my kids, you know. But at the same time, certain songs are fresh, and you you've only played them ten times, and and you want to play it again. And other songs, you think, man, maybe we, maybe we can give that one a break, you know. And that's the one song that, that somebody in the audience has come to hear you do that one song. Yeah, sometimes. But the thing is, is, is um, fortunately, the songs that, that have been singles for us have been songs that I really, really believe in. Um, and so Dairy to Move and Meant to Live are songs that I don't get tired of playing. Yeah, it would be a real drag if your hit becomes a song that you really don't like. I know, <laughs> yeah, I know tons of bands that... They hate playing their hits. They hate it. And they're like, they're like making faces the whole time. And yeah, like looking over at you like, sorry, like apologizing. And, um, you know, I mean, one of my favorite bands, they hate Creep. And that's one of their big songs. And, and, um, and they've been very vocal publicly about hating it. And, and I kind of don't like that. I kind of... It kind of makes me think, well, you know, you wrote it, and it, it's the one that, that got you big in right. the first place. It opened a lot of doors for yeah, you. Yeah, you know, and so I don't know. I, I'm, I, th I guess I just feel thankful that, that I, I really appreciate the, the songs that we've got. Do you have one more for us? Sure, sure. Um, we could play. Let's do, let's bring this guy out. Just because it's fun. <laughs> I remember uh, the first time I was playing this, and I don't see my wife anywhere, but she's here. And um, and I was trying to learn how to play the guitar and, and this thing at the same time. And it was a f it's probably not any less amusing than it is right now, but <laughs> I was worse at one point. All right. This is a song that I wrote. There's uh, this monastery. It's up in Santa Barbara that's amazing. And you can actually take the train from San Diego up, and that way you don't have to deal with L.A. traffic. And I feel like if, if you fought L.A. traffic on the way back, it would kind of negate the experience at the monastery. <laughs> and so this is a song that I, I, uh, I, I uh, wrote on the train ride home. Oh, 
rhythm of my heart My sleepy girl's breathing It's the rhythm of my southbound train Just feeling old Like a lawyer No one to blame I'm headed home Yeah, but I'm not so sure Home is a place That'll ever look the same Picking up our things and we head out in the cold. In your eyes, where you carry the pain. It's when I hear the whistle weeping, it's crying to the sky. It's the rhythm of my southbound train. It's the rhythm of my southbound. I came across an interview when, where, where an interviewer asked you, um, if there were one song you would want to be remembered by, what would it be and why? And I love John's response. He said, I hope I haven't written it yet. I still feel like I have a lot more to say. I think we do too. We hope that you have a lot more to say too. Thank you for being with us, and thank you so much for the song. Thanks a lot. Thank you, guys.